Hello, this is Lily. I'm just here to say thank you for joining us for what will be our final episode on Little Women. We love talking about these movies, and if you enjoyed listening to us, we would love it if you could leave us a rating and review on iTunes, as it would really help us out. We've got some new episodes in the works, which I'm really excited about, including a return to Black Sails. We've already got that one recorded, so keep an eye out for that. But for now, I hope you enjoy this episode on love interests, reimagining the concept of the family, and who or what we should be directing our criticisms towards when we critique these movies. So join us one more time as we ask the all-important question, does every generation deserve its own Little Women? talk about love interests i think so i think now's the time it's kind of interesting because we were talking about how even modern work sort of is more focused on the women in the story and what this does to the male characters is playing second fiddle to what's happening i would say i think that's deliberate though and i think we'll talk a bit more about this but like yeah and not a bad thing (laughs) yeah no (laughs) and i think it's yeah responding to some of the criticisms of the story as well yeah we're gonna talk about the shoehorned in guy the german professor that no one wanted the there. The funny match. <laughs> yes, yeah. the funny match. <laughs> professor Beer, who is a professor, I keep saying, definitely not from Germany. It's interesting because even in the subtitles, I just saw when I watched the 2019 version, it said Friedrich, and he yeah, said, I but know. he says Friedrich, so they don't even pretend in the 2019 version that he's German, which is fine enough. But it's so weird as a German person to just keep watching every adaptation, just keep going, this guy's German, and you're like, no, he's not. <laughs> No, he's not. I can tell that he's not. And it's like, yeah, 2019 version, he's very French. Yeah. Which, I mean, is... But it's funny, because he's sort of changed into a French character, but they don't explicitly say that. I mean, Professor Bayer isn't the most... They don't spend that much time on him in the 2019 version, deliberately, I think. It's not so much yeah. about him. But yeah, it's sort of funny. In the... Tw- I'm trying to remember in the 94 version, does he come across as more German in that one, or is it still kind of not particularly? He's vaguely European... Which to an American audience, I feel like is enough. Mm. I feel like yeah. they don't really differentiate there a lot. They just sort of feel like, yeah, he feels very like European. And I'm like, yeah, sure. <laughs> I mean, to me, he feels very French, but then I am from Europe. To me, European doesn't mean anything. To me, European means there's so many different people here. I have no idea what that means. But I get that it's sort of, it's a vague accent where you just couldn't really place it. To me, it sounds so French. It just isn't debatable to me that he isn't French. Yeah. And Louis Garel also looks to me very French. That to me is, oh, you know, oh, you're French. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. I don't know how offensive that is to say. <laughs> He's a beautiful person. Yes, like, yeah. Um, yeah. Also, I was so shocked. I looked this up right before we started. He's 39 years old. I thought he was a lot younger oh, than that. Oh, that's interesting because, yeah, because Bear's supposed to be... Older. Uh, like an older... He's supposed to be like middle-aged. Yeah. I mean, 39 is not middle-aged. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, it's still older than than I was expecting. Yeah, and, same, same, yeah, same. And older than Joe would be, than Joe is in the film. I thought he was going to be maybe early 30s. I did not think he was pushing 40. <laughs> I mean, he wasn't when they were shooting this, yeah. to be fair. Sure, yeah. Yeah, to be yeah. Fair. but I do think it was interesting that that's the depiction of the immigrant in this. And Lori has a similar thing of being vaguely Italian and artistic. And yeah. yeah, I think that is interesting because I think because they don't choose to spend an awful lot of time with Bear. And so he's there for the rom-com ending and he's introduced... But he is kind of the Manic Pixie Dream Boy type. He kind of just exists to be a love interest and isn't particularly developed. It's interesting because I feel like that's like trying to adapt Professor Bear and how to do that in a way that makes sense. Because I think the 90s version, what they do is they spend a lot of time with him and they spend a lot of time with him and Joe kind of developing that relationship so that by the time they get to their happily ever after, they've developed that relationship, they've developed that chemistry and it's, it works and that makes a lot of sense. And that is something that I quite like about the 90s version is how much their relationship works. But in the 2019 version... They chose to not develop, to spend very little time between Joe and Bear. They have a few interactions, that's kind of it. But I think that's a reaction to Alcock like creating this funny match that doesn't quite fit the text. And I think you've talked about this because you've seen the previous adaptations and most adaptations don't really know what to do with Bear. And I think these, the 90s and the 2019 version show the two kind of extremes of what you do with this character that sort of doesn't quite fit in with a novel. Do you choose to adapt it so that he does fit in and does actually become more of a character and create this relationship that does work 
Or do you lean into the fact that he doesn't really make sense here and that perhaps lean into like the implications of Joe shouldn't have ended up in a marriage, shouldn't have ended up in a relationship and choosing to adapt in that way. And I think that's quite interesting. What you just said in terms of other adaptations, in no adaptation do I ever want them to end up together except for mm. the 2019 one. I kind of think oh, really? that that's kind of the most... I with a of enticing one. I like the 90s one. I like the fact that they have a relationship that develops and he has respect for her and he wants to hear her opinion and he really cares about this young, intelligent person. Also, the scene where he says to her, I don't want to be your teacher. I really like that because he very much clearly states, I respect you. I respect what you do, but I also don't want you to ever feel like you're reduced to being less than because I have experience and you don't because that almost feels hot to me in a way because oh this is this guy coming up to her and being like I'm interested in you I don't give a fuck about the writing if that's where this is breaking yeah apart don't care about that I think that that's really respecting her as an equal saying I don't want to be your teacher but I think he's really cute in the 2019 version as well I just think that he's is but I just don't get I'm like I think the last because I've seen it a few times now I think the more I watch it the less I'm like it's always the last bit it's always the last bit every single adaptation I've seen it's always him showing up at the house yeah Every single time when that happens, I don't know why that doesn't ever satisfy. It always feels weird. It always feels strange. It always feels like, why are you there? If they developed a relationship in New York and got together in New York and I think stayed in New York or even the next big city from where they are, that would make mm. sense to me. Maybe he just doesn't make sense to me in that yeah. household. Maybe that's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's it. And no, I really don't like them together in 2019. I mean, I just think, I'm just like, they don't, like, he's nice. He's 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 perfectly decent. He's very good looking. He's a nice person, I guess. But I don't, I haven't seen them develop as like... He's a shitty professor. Hmm? He's a shitty professor. Yeah. He's no, so that's bad. that's a good point. And I think that's the funny thing about choosing, I think, deliberately not to develop their relationship too much because that's not the focus of the film because the focus are the other relationships and those are more important because they want to focus on Joe in relation to her sisters and in relation to her book because they don't develop that relationship that much when Bale gives her the advice on her book it seems to come out of, it's so harsh it's so harsh it just seems unnecessarily just rude <laughs> but that's the thing from the first time I watched this I remember him as being harsh that's not the issue I have though he doesn't give her feedback yeah he just tells her I don't think this is good and then she goes like what and then he's like I just don't think this is good and he asks her are you gonna write a novel and she goes yes I'm working on it and he's like is it gonna be like this and she says yes and then he says I don't think this is good and he gives her no like the pacing the uh, the character development the story arc nothing specific he just says this is not good and then he has the audacity sorry this is pissing me off but then he has the audacity to be like has no one ever talked to you like this before do you have no one to talk to you about your writing you're not talking to her about writing saying maybe this just isn't my type of story is more of a review than what you've just given someone this is not f and again a professor is meant to be teaching this is your job, buddy. But like, that's not giving feedback. I find that scene so infuriating because I love, I think it's also really funny in a weird way. It's written really well in the sense that she goes, you will never be anyone. No one will remember you. And he's like, well, that's sure. It's yeah. Like, that's very well, maybe sure. And then she goes like, I will, I'm not Shakespeare. And he goes like, well, thank God we already have him. <laughs> it's really funny. <laughs> Yeah, it is funny. No, that is what it is a well written scene, but it kind of comes out of nowhere. Like you said, he doesn't really offer any advice. And then he's like, Well, didn't you want honesty? Well, A, you've not really t told her anything. And B, we don't see them build the sort of relationship where that kind of honesty makes sense. Because in the 90s version, they actually, they've like interacted a ton. They've been to the opera together. They've kind of built up a relationship where she's like, oh, I feel confident enough now asking you to have a look at this. And he's like, okay, let me tell you, like, honestly, yes. what I think. You've earned your space to get there. And his harshness in that moment feels legitimate. And you're like, you're at that stage where that could, that's okay. And also he does give, what does he say again in the 94 version? I can't quite remember, but like. What is your honest opinion? I'm a professor of philosophy, Joe. <laughs> No, I'd really like to know what you think. You should be writing from life, from the depth of your soul. There's nothing in here of the woman that I'm privileged to know. <laughs> nice. <laughs> that is a beautiful line. That's a that's that's a good pickup line. There's nothing in here of the woman that I'm privileged to know. Because 
Yeah. That is kind of one saying that that's critiquing your writing in a really harsh way, actually, and saying this is not as good as it should be. It's such a backhanded compliment, yeah. <laughs> but also a really good, it's like, this is such a compliment, but also not to me, but just not to my writing. And also he says, Joe, yeah. there's more to you than this, if you have the courage to write it, which again is super backhanded because it's like, you could write better if you weren't such a coward about it, essentially, like... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and he does go the first novel, what a great accomplishment. He does compliment her on the fact that she's finished something as big as this, which is impressive. Yeah. yeah, I would say, yeah, I think that's a lot. And again, it's the thing you said about you have developed a relationship between these two people before he says that to her and not just like, this is not good based on nothing. <laughs> and Joe does in the 2019 version run out and goes, we are not friends. Don't talk to me anymore. And <laughs> yeah. I don't like you very much. So goodbye. <laughs> I think it's interesting because both of the scenes are meant to show Joe's anger, right? She's very quick to anger and she's not very well at taking criticism. But in the 2019 version, she's not <laughs> reacting to criticism because yeah. it's not criticism. That's kind of what I don't get yeah. about the critique that he's offering. It's nothing. If you say something straight up, not good, just maybe also it's just maybe not a thing. I just find that kind of strange. Yeah. <laughs> No, I think that's legit. But yeah, I think that because they choose not to develop Bea and Joe's relationship, that's what makes the double ending work better. Because if they had... I mean, I think it's a balance that you have to strike. They've got to be convincing enough that the original ending works. But also kind of like, because the focus isn't on Bea and because the focus is on Joe's relationship with her book and with her family and with the other characters and her relationship with Laurie... And Amy's relationship with Laurie doesn't really have the time to show Bea's relationship and has to kind of take a bit of a back burner, which I think is fine. But I think this is sorry, this is the comment that you started making earlier, but both Bea and Laurie are both these sort of immigrant characters. And there's a certain exoticism, I think, to Bea, the fact that he's not really developed as a character and the fact that Alcott decided to make him the funny match. There's that kind of exoticism about him as just the sort of shoehorned character. I feel like the, the 2019 version, because I did think it was really funny, I think maybe that's why I like it now. Like, it's sort of giving me a hint of a personality there. But it's not giving me anything more than that. And it's not giving me any more personality when he shows up at the house. He just is like, hey, can I play the piano? That's pretty much it. I'm an immigrant. I'm going to go to California. None of that is personality. Because, like, it would, like, it's, I think, like, again, Professor Bear is someone you can really develop to be a match for Joe. Like an opponent, but, like, not in a bad way. Yeah, I think it was in the Life article talking about the 90s version. There's a kind of awkwardness to their love that's sort of, like, quite cute and kind of nice. And they're quite nicely matched. Mm -hmm. And they're both quite intellectual, both quite awkward. And it's that unromantic romance that makes them work as a couple. Um, which I think I'd agree with. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. I think also maybe if Gerwig had given him more of a personality, maybe the ending also wouldn't work because you'd be too annoyed at this being fake, maybe. Again, another character they could do different things with. And I'm just glad that Gerwig did something really creative and really brilliant with. I agree. That is a beautifully written thing. Whether it's real or not. <laughs> Let's talk about everyone's favorite bad boy. I don't know if you're yeah. going to call him that. <laughs> the lonely orphan from next door. <laughs> Sounds a lot more negative. Let's talk about Laurie. I thought it was really interesting thinking about who Laurie was going to be in terms of the adaptation of being someone that holds the audience enough for you to want him to end up with Joe and also for you as the audience hopefully to fall in love with and be attracted yeah, to. Yeah, Laurie in each adaptation yeah. I think is supposed to, that you can track him as this male icon of the era, male heartthrob type, but a kind of boyish heartthrob I guess, rather than kind of masculine man heartthrob. The one in the 1930s he had that same facial expression and he almost looked unreal because the light kept reflecting off of his face and he kept looking like a doll with a constant smile on his face and I was like <laughs> Why do you keep having the same? Uh. <laughs> Which was really funny. Because we talked about, I don't know if there was ever a universally agreed upon heartthrob internationally, I mean, but for the English speaking world, there used to be more of a consensus about who the hot guy of the time was. Yeah, you'd have your Brad Pitts or George Clooney's. And yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I was having this conversation with some friends a little while ago because my friend's mum had asked, who's the heartthrob of your generation? And it's quite hard to pin down. And eventually, like, I don't know, maybe Timothée Chalamet, 
maybe Tom Holland, maybe Harry Styles, sort of slightly androgynous white boys kind of thing. That <laughs> that seems to be sort of flavour of the month. But it's quite difficult to actually kind of pin down one specific male heartthrob because of the way that media is kind of fragmented. There isn't just the kind of like everybody reads these particular magazines. Obviously, there was never just a monoculture, but there is certainly more fragmentation now with the internet. There's less of a very defined mainstream. So, yeah, which is to say, still, Timothy Chalamet potentially is this mainstream heartthrob character, but also it's interesting to look at him as that person in comparison to, I don't know, was Christian Bale like the heartthrob of the 90s? I was not old enough in 1994 to be aware <laughs> of what was going on. I think that Christian Bale, wasn't he really famous from, um, wait, no, was he from the Paper Boys movie? That's not what it's called. Oh, Newsies. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I don't know how famous Christian Bale was at this point, which is kind of fascinating because he's yeah. British but he's quite famous for American productions. And I don't know when he moved over there. Um, That's interesting. Yeah. I don't know how famous he was because I know Winona Ryder was really famous when she was in this because she's also uh, starring wise. She's quite at the top. It's always Winona Ryder as Joe. He does look very 90s to me because of the haircut. I've had this conversation with you before. It's the middle part in this haircut that looked good, I swear, on almost no one. It's like, it almost feels like an extension of the bowl cut. You gave a kid a bowl cut and then he's made it a little bit more different lengths and the sides or whatever. <laughs> but I swear every boy band member had that haircut in yeah. the 90s. Again, we've talked about this before, but they give him, when he's an adult, the yeah. goatee. Styled it. <laughs> Weirdest. Yeah, it's a choice. That's an interesting choice. I'm very glad they didn't choose to do that with yeah. Timothée Chalamet. Like... And we thought that Lori was interesting in terms of being quite a lonely character, actually. He's alone with a person who's paid to be there. The tutor isn't there because he's his brother or his cousin. He's there because he gets paid to be there. Yeah. As soon as he doesn't get paid to be there, he goes off to war. Like <laughs> He's someone he really grows close to, I would say. But it's not someone that's just organic part of the family for him. And I think that's what he desires the entire time. And Yeah. Like his parents are both dead and his grandfather really resents the mother who apparently was an artist and stuff in Italy, which is why he said to return in the first place because the mother is now passed. Yeah. And it's understanding that it does make more sense why Laurie is so intent on becoming part of the March, becoming legitimately, quote unquote, mm -hmm. part of the March family. Because like you say in the 90s version, he's like, I will become part of this family. I think I'm glad that's not explored quite so much in the 2019 version. I'm going to talk a bit more about that in a bit. I hadn't realised, but it does make him quite a, like an interesting parallel to Joe and to the marches, this loneliness that he has. And I think this story is a story about loneliness and connection for all of the characters, but especially Joe and Laurie as sort of parallel characters and Aunt March and all of them. But that desire to become part of a family... And that desire only being like, it's only possible to completely validate it through the institution of marriage is interesting. And I'm glad the 2019 version didn't go down that route so much and kind of questioned that. Yeah, I will say the 2019 version, it's the acting and the writing and the directing. Chalamet is really good in that scene where he proposes to Joe because he feels really unreasonable and immature. Yes. He, like we talked about with the asexuality, he feels a metronormativity of like, why does everyone expect this then? In that scene, you really believe that Joe loves Lori. She doesn't want to marry Lori. She doesn't think that this would be a good marriage. Lori really wants to marry her, but doesn't think about this in more depth than I'm in love with you. Maybe a good reason to get married, yes, but you need more than that. And the fact that Joe sees that their personalities just don't match, yeah, it's just so believable in that scene. And then also being able to argue that way over each other, I think mm -hmm. is really nice because when she keeps making her point, and you can still hear everything she says, but he keeps saying, I love you, Joe. I love you, Joe. I love you, Joe. He just doesn't want to listen. That's not the issue. I don't think that Joe questions whether he loves her. Yeah. She just thinks it's not going to be enough <laughs> to overcome everything that his life is going to be, yeah. where she just doesn't fit in. And that is why that seat is so yeah. great. They did that so well. And ugh, it's yeah. so beautifully done. It is so beautifully done. I think in a similar way to how Laurie and Amy are quite well matched, the nice thing about that scene, and again, I think in comparison to the 90s 
version of the proposal scene is that there's no sense that Laurie's going to overpower Joe or yeah. they're very evenly matched and Laurie listens to Joe and Joe has agency and power in that scene even though Laurie is able to speak but she like ultimately speaks and makes that decision and he has to respect that even though he doesn't want mm-hmm. to and he's upset about it and it's just very nicely played their kind of character dynamic is so so good and so nice. Also him like threatening with saying I'd rather die just emphasizes the fact that he's just way too immature to get married to anybody right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's sort of it's really nicely done because it doesn't feel super manipulative. I think because Joe has that agency in that scene and the way that Sersha Ronan plays that, it works so well. And the way that Laurie plays it as well, he doesn't feel like a threat to her in that scene. And it's immature, but it doesn't feel gross. It feels like this is a really messy situation. Yeah. And it's not nice for either of them. But they're able to still treat each other with respect, even even so. Yeah. No, I agree. And I think it is that amateur normativity, which he doesn't seem to see at all, which is the thing that he always says in every adaptation. You know, you will fall for someone one day. Mm. And you will fight for them because that's your way. He always says some version of that in every adaptation to her. And it's so sad because he cannot imagine this person just existing on their own. Even though he's seen this person being very capable of taking care of themselves. He just doesn't understand this person to be someone who just... That's the bit where he's getting super immature. It's like, it's going to really hurt him to see her with someone else as well. Yeah, That's not the reason you should get married to someone either. And it's also that kind of, it'll be that one other person that this person will love, and then that means that you're not part of their life properly anymore. Mm -hmm. Which is the thing that Joe is terrified of when other people get married. Yeah, very true. Whereas the thing about Joe is that she, uh, in the alternative ending, she does have that independence, and you know she stands alone with her book, and it's a love story between her and her book, and so she is independent and proud in that moment. But also, like we talked about before, you know, she's at the house, she's at the school, and Laurie is still a huge part of her life, and the rest of her family is still a huge part of her life, and she's able to love and fight for them, but she doesn't have to just choose one person. It's all these people here that she's living her life amongst, and also these people who, even the people who have coupled up, and even if you see Joe as having coupled up, they're still living their lives together as part of a wider sort of family, rather than just living and dying for just one other person. So then, like, even if Laurie, even if you decide to read Joe as married at the end, it still sort of proves Laurie wrong in a sense because she's still living within this wider community of people as well. I agree. I completely agree. And yet, the thing that I find sad is the attic scene when Laurie tells Joe that he's married to Amy. Mm. Because beyond that, it feels like something broke between them, like something's shifted. That sort of playfulness that they had before which necessarily doesn't have anything to do with becoming more mature. That shouldn't have to go away, but it has to somehow because of Amy. And that's really sad. Because they as friends worked so well, and that doesn't seem to be continuing really. She's sort of shifted away from the two of them because she's jealous to a degree that those two ended up together or sad or something. Like, the tone between them has shifted, and that makes me very sad. I agree with you, although I would say that these two characters haven't seen each other in several years, I think. And you don't get to see a lot of them after they've reunited. So it's sort of not quite clear. Yes, in that moment, that relationship has changed, and and very well probably has changed to a certain extent. But you kind of don't really get to see how it fully plays out with them in their adulthood, because it then... We're just not shown those scenes. So I think there is still space to kind of imagine their relationship might still kind of be able to hold some of that playfulness and childishness once they settle back into routine, but probably still change, like you said. I wish I would see that. Because I can only ever see him with his baby or with Amy. And I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with showing that, but he only ever seems to be jealous. When Professor Bear sits down, he's the one who keeps asking, who is this? Yeah. <laughs> Somebody tell me who this man is. Yeah. Um, the thing about Beth that I wanted to mention that I completely forgot about is that when I rewatched the 2019 version is that when you talk about Beth, one of the things that I did like for a second and then it again just didn't do enough for me was her relationship to Mr. Lawrence. Mm-hmm. You do see a little yes. bit of her personality as being someone who wants to thank him for this grand gesture. And art is something that she still pursues and even that sort of allows her to overcome her shyness sometimes because she does desire to play on such a beautiful piano. And 
I wish that there would have been more exploration between the two of those characters because of both people who often don't say what they think for different reasons. Mm. And I wish that that would have been explored more again. But again, it's one of those things where I thought when I rewatched the 2019 one, maybe there is more there than I saw at first. But then I thought, no, because the ending of that is Mr. Lawrence mourning and in that's getting closer to Joe again. Mm. Again, it's not about Beth. Yeah. It's about what that does for other characters. And I find that really depressing. Yeah, and I think just a final yeah. word that I want to put on, not just Laurie and Joe's relationship, but kind of all of the relationships in the show. Yeah. In the story, in the film, in the films, in the adaptations, in the um, <laughs> cultural artifacts. The talkies. Is this concept of family and how it resettles at the end of the film. Uh, something that didn't strike me until kind of recently. In the beginning of the film, even though it's, you know, the March family, the speaking of the family and the home and wholesomeness, they're not really, they're not structured as a nuclear family. Even, like, Laurie obviously isn't part of a nuclear family. He's living with his grandfather and his tutor, and he's an orphan. But the Marches, their father isn't home, and their mother sometimes also isn't home. So they're kind of in the single-parent household. And they also have Aunt March as this sort of, like, other parental figure who's there. And so even from the get-go, you don't really have this nuclear family. And it's this thing that Joe is really, really holding on to and is worried about losing. And, you know, she's so resistant to the idea of marriage. That's sort of how the story starts off. And then I think especially in the 2019 version, although also to an extent in the 90s version, there is that sense that Joe's fear of marriage isn't unjustified. And not even in Amy's sense of, you know, you lose your financial, like, independence you lose different kinds of independence but with marriage comes separation comes loss you mentioned in dickinson in the show dickinson which is about emily dickinson and kind of set at a similar time the mother character gets married and never sees her family again and that's one of the kind of elements of the show it's this idea of what would have happened if uh, amy had married fred Wan. yes in dickinson they make fun of this because it's very it's a very different tone uh, of yeah. the show but she talks about the fact that since she's gotten married she's never had access to her family since then because as a woman again we're not your own entity you belong to your father and then you belong to your husband the second you get married you're no longer you no longer have sisters i mean you do have sisters but those are not your prime focus and those are not the family that you're supposed to be taking care of you're supposed to be taking care of your husband's family that would have happened if Amy had married Fred Vaughn. She would have been yeah. gone. They would have never gotten to be in that big house again altogether. Yeah. She would have been wherever he chose to be for business. When he was in London for business, she would have... I mean, if he would have taken his wife with her. But wherever he chose to settle his family, that would have been where she would have been. And if she had been told not to see her family, then she would have never seen them again. And that wouldn't have been questioned. Because she doesn't get to have that decision power in a patriarchal society. She doesn't have the right to make her own decisions in that sense. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And and I think that's the kind of nice thing, again, that the 2019 version does. In the very end, when everyone's gathered in the house, it's an alternative form of family. And it's a return to this collectivity. It's a return to childhood. It's a return to this form of family that the sisters had as children. Like Red, throughout the film, it's split between red lighting for their child, like the childhood sequences and this kind of harsh blue lighting for the adulthood sequences. And then at the very end, it's a return to this childish reddish glow. And like you mentioned before, Laurie in the 90s version is very intent on becoming part of the family through legitimate means, whereas in the 2019 version it's implied that he is already part of this family. Laurie, you don't need to make this a legitimate thing, you're already part of this family. And it shows that again at the end where this family is like this big thing where everyone's together. And it's this very ideal, idealistic but also kind of sweet and, and just a nice alternative representation of where these families can go. Like in the 90s it ends on the, the couple kissing in the rain, which is fine. But in the 2019 version, it's actually here's a version of family that has couples in included in it, but that's not the main point. And like, Mommy is still there, and Joe's still there, and there's also all these all this other family around. 2019 is more about them returning to the mother, right? Because she's the focus yes! point at that point, right? Yes, yes, you're right. It's, Absolutely. it's like the husbands follow the sisters rather than the sisters following the husbands. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's, it also speaks to, again, to bring in the author, which we want to do with a pinch of salt. Yeah. But at the beginning of the 2019 version, they use the quote from Alcott, um, where she talks about how she writes jolly tales because she's lived a difficult life. Mm -hmm. And yeah, she did live quite a hard life. I think Amy, well, the sister based on Amy, who I think was Abigail, died in childbirth when she was quite young. Obviously, Elizabeth died and the, the family really struggled because they didn't have very much money. The father was very idealistic and sort of that meant that the family had to struggle.
struggle with quite a lot of very practical things. And so this beautiful image of all the family, barring Beth, back together again, living in this idealistic place is, I don't know, just, it's almost sad, but in a kind of beautiful way. It is idealised, but that's kind of the point, because sometimes life is just a bit harsh and you kind of just want to imagine what, what it could be and what would be nice if it could be. It would have been nice if that would have been her ending, I guess. Yeah. Her just being with whoever she wanted to be or not, in her case. And didn't she also take one of her sister's kids? Yes. After one of the uh, sisters yeah, died, I think, so, yeah. I think she also became a little bit of a marmy figure for the family of bringing people together and using the money to feed everybody. And I think it's a good thing. It sort of ends with them all gathering around the matriarch of the family as opposed to this patriarchal structure and with their kids and offspring and everybody. Although everybody coupled up very much like pairs of two. But yeah, it's this hopeful ending and it's also passing on this freedom to sort of imagine a future with the autumn colour, like the red colours, this autumnal changing of the seasons. It's a return to childhood with these new children passing on this freedom to a kind of hope for the future that these things, perhaps in the future people will have even, like there'll be even more freedom for these children <laughs> in this new, to new topic. And like with education comes liberation and which yeah it's all a little bit cliche but it's also quite nice yeah it's lovely so we've talked a lot about the different adaptations why this story has been adapted and kind of like what these different adaptations bring to the table but now we're going to talk a bit more about some of the criticisms of the adaptations and the story itself and about whether this story should continue to be remade we're also going to broaden our conversation out to talk about where we should be directing these criticisms and explore some of the nuances of this debate Whenever we talk about criticism of this kind of stuff, we think that there is absolutely stuff to criticize, but we feel whenever this criticism gets brought up, it tends to sort of ignore different aspects of the institutions in which this bad thing took place. And we wanted to talk about Little Women here specifically because this is yet another very white movie that takes place during the Civil War which is not a new thing in American cinema. And you have very few black people show up in the 2019 adaptation. And I don't think I saw any black people in the 90s version that I remember. Yeah, which is interesting because I feel like the 90s version is more explicit about the politics of the time. We kind of, I mean, we talked about how it sort of does that kind of 90s thing of equating the struggle of black people with the struggle of white women. But it also talks about the use of silk mills and child labor. I was going to say that re-watching the 90s one, I also think it's interesting because the friend of Meg says something like, you don't get silk from the silk mills in the South. We get it right near here. Yeah. And then Meg sort of confronts her and says, all the silk mills use child labor. All of them do. And I think that's kind of interesting because this idea of the North being good sort of tends to focus more on praising people from the North as being the good white people yeah. uh, instead of focusing on the people who are actually most affected by this whole struggle. And I was, that's why I think the 90s one is also much more interesting in that aspect. Definitely. Because in like the 2019 version, it does reference the Civil War, but it's kind of, it does feel quite blink and you'll miss it. At one point, Aunt Mark says when she's talking to Joe about kind of her future prospects and things and about Mami she says that Joe's father was more interested in um, educating freedmen's children than looking after his own children which the first time I watched it I didn't kind of think about what freedmen men means obviously enslaved people mm -hmm. who are no longer enslaved uh, but that didn't it was such a like a quick line like it said so quickly that yeah. it doesn't really feel like it's kind of blinking you'll miss it you have a black like train ticket person sorry I, english is not my first language i can never remember what that's called i think you said it's not a uh, ticket collector or like i i'd say conduct i, I want to say conductor but then i'm also like am i getting that word wrong because is that just the person on the platform but i'm pretty I have sure, no idea just say i say like ticket collector yeah. or like they have you have member of train staff yes you have one person who does that you have one black woman reacting to marmy saying she's ashamed of her country and the woman responds with, you should still be ashamed of your country. Yeah. And then you have a lot of kids sort of as background in the school. We talked about that utopian display of that. And I think it's telling with like the one black female character who's kind of represented on screen as her features as a speaking role. And she is given a name in the script, um, which I'll find in a second. Uh, Susan Robbins. But she's not named. She doesn't say, hey, Susan. She doesn't address her, which even that would give her more of an identity. Even if Marmy said Susan to her, that would give you more of an understanding that these people interact with each other outside of this one space and moment. If they address each other by name. 
even that would give you more of an understanding of these characters. And it's like in that scene, it's Susan says to Marmy that you should go home to the girls, I can take care of this. It's kind of the one moment where Marmy is offered some sort of support and sort of like <laughs> someone kind of stepping in for her. Yeah. Um, but again, it's sort of, it's telling that the one moment this happens is it's labour from a black woman. It's a black woman who is able to support Marmy, the white woman who is sort of this kind of, you know, she's taking on the emotional labour of her family. And so that kind of labour is still hierarchized within the film as well. Even I mean, this is also a very small moment. This is a kind of very short scene and Susan isn't given an awful lot to do. But I think that's also quite telling. Again, the ticket conductor or collector, train conductor, ticket collector, just exists to tell Joe that she's at the platform, time to get off the train. And then with the characters at the end in the school... Again, we've kind of talked about this idea of like colorblind utopia, where girls and boys of the. Uh, wait, I'll read what it actually says in the script. Joe is supervising a great number of rambunctious girls and boys of all races and ages. They are finishing lessons for the day, and everyone runs outside at full speed. Joe Tate makes her way down the stairs and is handed a homemade cake by one of the children. She kisses him on the head and continues through what she's built. Every inch of the school is covered with the student's work. All of the former stiffness, stuffiness is gone. She's in her heaven. And again, it's this final utopian image of like progressive multiculturalism, kind of living in harmony, like everyone's happy. Uh, Multicultural bliss, but like none of the black characters are kind of named or are very much more than background to Joe's heaven, like Joe's heavenly space. None of them are part of the plot. If you deleted all of those characters, you wouldn't lose anything. Yeah, exactly. That all kind of set dressing or like background. And there's also like no explicit disability. There's no sort of disabled characters aside from Beth, who we've talked about, like her storyline and how she's minimized in relation to the abled characters. There are also no fat people in this film, aside from maybe... Hannah. It's this idea, especially with disability, I think important to note that, again, much like, fun enough, pirate stories tend to have a lot of disability in them. Not by disabled people necessarily, but a lot of like taking out eyes and cut off limbs because of the way that we think pirates look, again, because of pre-read text. And one of the other movies that tend to always feature someone, like necessarily, again, Usually actors who are disabled don't get to play these kind of parts. You usually have disability in war movies because people come home from war with a lot of um, both yeah. physical and psychological wounds. It's again just something that just doesn't get shown here. Very explicitly, what you yeah. see in this movie are white, thin, straight cis people for the most part, unless you're talking about subtext. And like even Mr. March comes home and he's like oh my little women um the bob odenkirk <laughs> depiction just sort of comes home doesn't seem to be struggling mentally with whatever he's seen at war which i'm assuming was horrible but i just find it really strange that the representation in this is still so and again we just talked about this like over and over again we love this movie like we're not being critical of it overall to say this is a bad movie is completely mm -hmm. just missing a lot but also to not be mentioning this i think is very strange if you think about it logically in terms of its depiction of yeah. a story that is about a war that was kind of important in American history. Yeah. And I will also say that when I watched this as a teenager, I did not look up. I don't know how, how young I was. I did not look up which war this was. And it did not occur to me which war this was. I just thought, oh, this is a period film. They always used to have a lot of wars. <laughs> like Because it is not important enough to be very clear which war it is. And again, if a movie isn't very explicit about these things, like, why would you remember? And so that's something we wanted to criticize. But then we also want to expand on that and ask, who do you criticize here? Who should you criticize here? Yeah, so it makes sense, I guess, to start with criticizing the script, the director. There are known figures when a film is made. And I think in this section, we're going to reference a Bro Deschanel YouTube video called uh, Greta Gerwig and the Universal Girl, I want to say. Yeah, Lily has mentioned it before, yeah. yeah. Gerwig, uh, for example, is sort of like a figure who often has like these criticisms directed towards her, to an extent with good reason. But also, this video asks the question, like, is our frustration with commerce or with art? And that's a quote from Brendan Taylor's article talking about the book A Little Life. And so we think it's important to kind of look at individual films and also more broadly at the pattern of films as well. And like the broader industry that films exist within yeah. are making these criticisms. Because what we're talking about is something that I also struggle with. And if anyone has anything to link me to that answers this eloquently, intelligently, please tell me, please like send it to us. Because I find it really hard to understand how you sort of manage to break 
apart, criticizing a pattern the way that certain groups are depicted without only ever shooting the criticism only at very specific creators. Because I understand that the pattern is made up of like multiple individual films, but then also to blame an individual film for a pattern feels wrong. So we wanted to break it down a little bit. And like Lily said, that Critica Rick gets this kind of criticism a lot, whereas when white men tend to not necessarily get that kind of criticism. And it is not wrong to criticize her for making movies that tend to always be about yeah. white, cis, thin people. But when we yell only ever at marginalized creators to not have more marginalized characters in them, what are we sort of left with? Yeah. Even in a criticism, I feel like we give the benefit of the doubt to white straight men for doing very little because it's sort of like, well, that's the neutral setting in Hollywood. It's just like who they gave the job to. And as soon as they give it to someone who's like a little bit more, uh, like more marginalized than that, we sort of are like, well, why didn't they give it to like someone different than that? And you're like, well, why am I yelling at this person now? Even though that's a valid criticism to criticize why this person got the job it's not saying that that's i'm not saying that that's wrong yeah. but why am i yelling at this one creator when that's like who am i yelling at and that's again the conversation about uh commerce and art and so films made by white cis men do not get this kind of treatment so who should we be yelling at here or what should we be criticizing here in terms of being critical of these still existing discriminatory structures and discriminatory decisions yeah where we should we be directing this critique i think it's also interesting because it's like obviously like gerwig in herself has like quite a lot of privilege but i also think a story like little women also has a lot of kind of cultural capital the life article tries to argue that little women is not part of canon which i think is just wrong or just i don't know what, what they're trying to say but the fact that like there is so much there's so much like academic work around this book probably to like not the extent that i don't know like I don't know around Ulysses or something like I don't know but like there's still a lot of academic work around this text and there's also just been so many adaptations of this film even when we're talking about the 1933 version we're talking about the first talkie that came after two silent films and again we started talking about doing little women right after we did passing which is a book that's over 100 years old or in a 100 yes. years old technically and that has so far had one adaptation one and that was last year one and obviously the reason that wasn't adapted earlier is to do with all the racism and sexism kind of bound up in hollywood and then the fact that this story hasn't had the opportunity to kind of get going with adaptations means that it's that much harder for it to sort of it's had that slow start and so it's now on a back foot compared to a film like little women which can like continually be remade and it sort of has that structural advantage because it's already been remade so many times and it's now seen as a kind of a safe bet and a classic a film for every generation because this film has structurally been allowed to be made sooner and then readapted sooner and sooner because it is a part of the canon it already has so many that advantage is just like build up exponentially over time it's the idea of what you said about it having cultural weight you need to give things space to develop cultural weight in different forms of media in order to even get to that spot of being part of canon to the degree that it sort of becomes, I guess, mainstream enough. It's not necessarily the thing that I'm looking for, but established enough as a thing for it to leave academic discussion spaces and not just be something that you learn about in college. Because we both talked in the passing episode about having read about passing as an example of different tropes and like different storylines and a very specific depiction of well, passing. Um, but I don't know that that story is as well known as it should. It's not as well known as it should be. That's just what it is. I don't think that there's an attempt there to make sure that it's as well known as it should be. Because from what I remember, both Tessa Thompson and Ruth Nagel were talking about the fact that when they read this, they were shocked that this hadn't been adapted before. Well, like at least one of them talked about this. And when you read it, you do think it's kind of wild because this is such a rich text that has so many themes and interesting aspects to it. And again, you talked about three different categories of adaptation. Like all of these different adaptations do different things with it and speak also about the times that they were made in. You cannot establish that if you adapt something once every hundred years. That doesn't work. And Little Women has had so much time 
to keep being remade and remade and remade. And I'm not just talking about movies. I'm also talking about operas and Broadway and animation. And you have given this thing space to become part of canon, but also part of just literature for little girls around the world in terms of English language stuff. Not that this is not available in German, that's not what I'm saying, but like uh, in in other uh, translations. But you are not giving other stories that aren't white-centered the same opportunity to even start to see whether other people could be inspired by other stories like you're not even given the opportunity for that to be arguing <laughs> against the life magazine here is i don't think this is not canon that's not true because if you talk about american literature you will talk about little women at some point and so and this is again not arguing that little women shouldn't be adapted right this is about arguing why this is the safe bet of period drama that gets remade every couple of decades So one of the arguments that I think is interesting that Bro Deschanel argues is that that the intention of the story is not universality, but the whole point is that these are four sort of similar girls. These are the girls with the same parents, with the same money. These are the same girls in terms of their background and how are they different coming from the same background. So we are sort of arguing about should each generation have its own little women? Is maybe asking the wrong question, I would say, maybe. I think, yeah, in the Bro Deschanel video, their kind of conclusion is that Gerwig isn't trying to represent the universal girl. Mm -hmm. And actually, she's showing like a particularity of experience. And so these films shouldn't be kind of like held up as this sort of universal girlhood. And actually, more films should be being made to represent different forms of experience. And I think the importance of this is sort of referenced within the film itself. Mm -hmm when Joe, Amy and Meg are kind of having this conversation about Joe's new work and Joe's sort of like, oh, I don't know if anyone's going to want to listen to this sort of story of domestic struggle. And she kind of says like, writing doesn't confer importance, it reflects it. And Amy responds by saying, I'm not sure, perhaps writing will make them more important. And it's this kind of idea that like, if telling stories reflects or confers importance, then more people need to be able to tell their stories. Yeah, which again is not the fault of Gerwig. Yeah, it's a fault of the industry for not giving the resources to other creators to tell different stories which is sort of like a wider structural issue rather than just an issue with one creator. Yeah, the video goes into lots of detail also on like whether a white director like Gerwig, if the, the problem is like there are like no people of colour in her film or like very few like black and people of colour in her film, like should she be as a white director telling those experiences and sort of talking about how like there's the option to have collaborative writing but then also like for authenticity of experience and also for like, I don't know, just like ethically, it shouldn't, ne those should, aren't necessarily her stories to tell. It's again, not just one film director. It's about kind of creating the opportunities for and giving the resources to more film directors to tell those experiences. Because again, we talked about this when we talked about passing. We talked about the fact that they were having really hard time getting together like what, like 10 million to make this film, whereas Sony decided to give Gerwig 40 million to make this film. I'm not saying that she got paid 40 million. I'm saying that's at the alleged production costs, not counting marketing usually in those things. You know, it's about how much money are you willing to invest in people's stories that aren't necessarily your own. Again, when it comes to this idea of there being limited resources, which is always the argument, they don't seem to be having limited resources for a lot of really shit basic movies that white male directors get to make. And a lot of the time, a lot of movies also flop. They don't make their money back. And then it doesn't become about... Mm whether white men should be allowed to make movies, whether it's financially responsible to let white male directors make movies. Like, that's never the conversation. And again, why does Little Women keep being remade? One of the reasons is it's always made money. Even in 1933, that movie did really well. And they know that it's not necessarily even seen in the current climate, also with tentpole movies and stuff. This is not even a mainstream movie because it's not a Marvel Cinematic Universe release, right? But... um. Again, if you're talking about like having, we wrote down establishing cinematic relevance slash an audience, uh, you need to give stories that aren't told from only one perspective time to actually establish an audience. And that doesn't necessarily have to come in the context of a movie. That can be a television show. It can be different forms of media. But again, if you've ever read Passing, I keep finding it so shocking. I mean, it shouldn't shock me. It is super shocking that that movie has never been made before. 
And I think that brings us to, so we've got our kind of concluding points of there aren't limited resources, but there is industry bias and we need to see those resources being given to more marginalised creators so that it's, there's less pressure on individual ones to kind of represent every single experience. And I think also what could be helpful is getting rid of the idea of canon. I think the fact that a text like Little Women, which arguably is very much a part of at least cinematic canon, like the fact that that this can be remade so many times when a text like Passing gets left out of that canon, I think it's important to look at who decides what canon is, who controls the canon, what criteria makes something canon, and deconstructing that and kind of deconstructing the prestige of canon so that more movies can get made and so that we don't we don't get stuck with the same kind of story. <laughs> no, wait, I'm not sure if I want to say like we don't get stuck with the same stories being retold. But then at the same time, it's kind of fun to see like different adaptations. We've just talked all about why it's cool to see different adaptations. Oh no. So I agree with you. And I think that links back to what you were saying about that scene where Amy and Joe and Meg talk about whether telling stories reflects or confers importance. And if you have the money available, which these big studios do, then you need to give those to people who can tell their own stories so that they can reflect or confer importance. And because these movies tend to be made for international audiences because of the money that these studios demand that these movies make back for them. And we know that they have money to spend because they tend to throw a lot of not very experienced as indie directors into these giant sci-fi films. So we know that they, are, that they are willing to spend a lot of money and to make movies that are a huge risk to them still. So they are willing to take risks. And so if they are, then they should be taking risks on much smaller creators and not necessarily always the same kind of director. And that also questions though whether, and I think you and I are both make, sort of making this argument that the whole point of being in a canon cannot be the goal here, because if we're talking about an international canon, what belongs in there? And is it Shakespeare? Is it Goethe? Is it who gets to make this decision? And also just by the very fact that there is a canon means you need to be excluding things because a canon is about being in this prestigious position of being considered something that is elementary to teaching children, teenagers and adult students about what is considered high class or important literature. And that always will exclude a lot of texts that aren't just doesn't sort of fit this mainstream definition of a certain time period. And what we sort of need to be focusing on is deconstructing the idea and the prestige of canon to begin with. We tend to be going round and round again to the same argument that we made on our Bob's Burgers episode when we talked about white feminism is the point to join, to have a seat at the table. In this case, it's canon, or is the point that there shouldn't be a table with limited seating in the first place. Thank you for listening to this episode um, on Little Women. If you are able to, it would be really, really helpful if you could rate and review us on iTunes. We're now asking people to do this because we want to try and spread this podcast more, try and grow it. So yeah, if you like us, please recommend us to people, write and review on iTunes to kind of try and like get the word out. If you want to get in touch with us, let us know your thoughts, feelings, anything like that. Tell us we're wrong. I'd love to hear that as well. You can find us at Liliana Pod on TikTok, Instagram and Twitter. So that's L-I-L-I-A-N-N-A pod. And then we are also Liliana's pre-read media tech on Tumblr. I think it's time for your recommendation. So my recommendation would be the books and works of Silvia Moreno Garcia. I think the first one I read was Mexican Gothic, which I just did not expect to be so into as I was. And then I read it in a day and a half. And so far, I've only read Mexican Gothic, Certain Dark Things, The Daughter of Dr. Moreau. And I'm currently reading and probably today finishing The Beautiful Ones. So that's the only ones I can sort of uh, vouch for that I liked. I love you like, oh, the only ones, and that's like five books. I'm like, that's more books than I've read in the last like four months. But no, that sounds lovely. No, that sounds really, really interesting. We've talked about the daughter of Dr. Moreau and sort of ad adaptations. It's a retelling of a H.G. Wells book, which is called The Island of Dr. Moreau, yeah. which I'd never heard of before because I'm not educated in 
English lit or sci-fi literature or literature. <laughs> yeah, I did one science fiction literature module last year, and so now I'm an expert. It did come up quite a lot, actually, but I haven't... So, like, Anna, you were like, oh, I read this book, it's really good, and I was like, oh, it's the book about blank, and you were like, oh, I didn't even think of that. You were like, oh, wow, that never even crossed my mind. And I was like, yeah, I, I didn't come up with that. I've not read this book, I've just read stuff about this book, so, like, I cannot claim any credit for this, like, opinion on this book that I haven't read. The reason I recommend her is I sometimes find it really hard to get into books until sometimes almost half of the way through. And I don't have that issue with her. I find her even more impressive as a writer. She drags me in with the interpersonal stuff and then something bizarre happens and keeps my attention for the entire time in a way that I cannot really articulate. But I just highly recommend her writing and it really got me out of a reading slump. Another book that I would highly recommend because it's written in verse is Clap When You Land by Elizabeth Acevedo, who also wrote Poet X. Again, someone who writes beautifully, you're just sort of so shocked that someone who writes a story where you sort of forget that it's written in verse. And I think it's really beautiful that there are people out there who can write like this. Yeah, but that's my God. How many books did I just recommend? Anyway, look up <laughs> Elizabeth As look up look up Elizabeth Acevedo and Silvia Moreno Garcia. They're both fantastic and I highly recommend them. This isn't like this will not be new to you at all, Anna, because I think You've recommended this to me before as well, but I just want to recommend just the YouTuber, um, the YouTube channel CJ the X, which you've spoken to me a lot about. But like, I love their videos, and I like. I think also the video on like objectivity in art, and I've watched part of the subjectivity in art one. It inspired me to want to create good things and create better things, and kind of think about like what I'm doing when I'm creating things and when I'm critiquing things, and just use my brain basically. And yeah, I was like, this is really really good, and I love it. So that's my recommendation. And we, of course, as always, end also with a dad joke. So, Lily. Yes. Did you hear about the new British period drama? Oh, another one? No, I've not heard about this. Tell me more. They're calling it Bloody Hell. <laughs> <gasps> oh, that took me too long. Thank you. Oh, that's re actually quite good. That's all I found, by the I way. I haven't rolled my eyes, so I'm actually... What jokes did you look up? Because all the jokes that I've been read periods. Thank <laughs> you.